Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Peace Lutheran in Aiken. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is for us to be, to be together today on this gorgeous day that God has created for us. Today, we're going to be talking about a hard truth, a hard truth that goes against so much of what people will tell us about our society today, and that hard truth is we put ourselves first, or last, sorry, last, realizing that our God himself is the only one that we need to put us first. That'll be the meditation, or the of our meditation this morning. We'll begin with our first song, O Come to the Altar, May God... There you 
your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Please stand. This morning we'll open our service by offering a prayer according to Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. We turn to our God again, as we do every single week, and ask for his mercy, confident in his forgiveness for us. We have come into the presence of God who has created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore... Let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me of my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. With the peace that forgiveness brings, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the peace from above and for our salvation, we pray. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, we pray. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, we pray. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. We sing a song of praise, no longer slaves. chosen me I'm 
Lord be with you. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson is a short one. It's taken from Proverbs. And it's just a couple of verses that get us centered on what the theme of the day is. That the Christian isn't called to put themselves first. The Christian isn't called to exalt himself or herself. That the Christian is called to be humble. And to serve. And to put themselves last. Do not exalt yourself in the king's presence. And do not claim a place among his great men. It is better for him to say to you, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. Our second lesson for this morning is a longer one, and it's taken from the book of James. The book of James is is a book written to the Christian church that presupposes the gospel. It assumes that all of these people know that their justification comes through grace alone, and it says, now... Now here's how you live as a Christian. And in James 2, we hear just one facet of that Christian life, that the Christian life is filled with humility. A lesson from James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. 
But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. We'll continue with our sermon hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Our sermon this morning is based on Luke chapter 14, verses 1 and 7 through 14. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When he noticed how guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, 
you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. A few years back, I went to a football game. It was a pro football game. I'm, I'm sitting in the, in the stands, and it was right before kickoff. And so most everybody else had sat down, but I look and I see, sure enough, four young men are walking up the aisle looking for their seats. And they're looking down. They stop where my seat was, and they, they look down at their ticket. They look at the older gentleman st- sitting next to me, look back at their ticket, look at the gentleman, and they'll go, hey, you're in my seat. And the guy, kind of bewildered, looks up at them and says, you think I'm in your seat? And they go, yep, you're in our seat, you got to move. And the guy goes, now listen, son, I've been a season ticket holder for 25 years. I've watched 25 years of football games from this exact seat. I don't think I'm the one in the wrong seats. You're the one in the wrong seats. And sure enough, they call the usher down, and the usher comes over and explains to these young men that, that, yeah, sure enough, they were on the other side of the aisle, and so they had to tuck their tails between their legs and go to the other side of the aisle, and they, they sat in their seats, kind of eating a little bit of humble pie with some, some booze in the first, the first quarter of the game. They were knocked down a peg. And today in our reading, Jesus talks about being knocked down a peg, being put in your place. But he goes a little further. He doesn't say you should be knocked down a peg. He says you should knock yourself down a peg. He calls us to look not first and foremost at our needs or our wants or our desires, at our accomplishments, our achievements. He calls us to look outward and look to the other people that are in society, the people that are around us, and think of them as more than us. To think of them as people who deserve our love, who deserve humility from us. That's why Jesus is, is telling the story today. You could, you could sort of think about him and he's, he's sitting at this table, he's reclining at this table and you'd, you'd imagine it's a, it's a pretty good attendance. There's, there's quite a few people wrapped around this table and maybe there are, there are multiple tables and you can kind of see Jesus just sitting back and, and watching them bustle around and, and size each other up. You can imagine him, him just watching them as they, as they compare one another, as they compare the status, maybe the wealth. They compare one another to each other and they find themselves trying to pick out the seat that they think is best for them. And that's why Jesus tells the story. Because he sees that not one of them was acting in humility. Every single one of them was acting in pride. Every single one of them was looking out for numero uno. The first, the best themselves. And so he looks around and he puts it right in front of them. And he puts their their arrogance and, and their lack of humility on full display for them. It's something that the Pharisees were struggling with that day. That idea of humility. And it's something that our society struggles with as well. Our society, our culture, tells us that we can't afford to be that humble. We can't afford it. Why? Because if you in today's America are not looking out for yourself, then who is? If you're not looking out for head honcho, if you're not trying to put yourself before everybody else, if you are not wriggling your way to the front, jostling for position, then you are going to be left in the dust. And the last thing you would want to do in our society, in our culture, is look like a sucker who's put last. Who's put last. Is that a place where we're okay with being? Is that a place where where you and I are, are okay living our lives before or after other people? Even sinners? I guess the question here, because it's not an easy thing to see, the question here is how often do we look around and say, you owe me. I deserve this. Because the truth of the matter is, when it comes to pride, when it comes to selfishness, 
it is one of the most blinding sins on planet Earth. We could look around and we could see celebrities or athletes or politicians and we, we look at them and we go, boom, selfish, of course. Or, or yeah, that's, that's a very self-absorbed thing to do. Or, or, yes, they're certainly putting their needs ahead of everybody else. That's easy to do from the outside. But what happens when it's turned on us? So often, those are the moments in which we're most blind. Those are the moments in which, which we can't see the places where we're putting ourselves first. Where we can't see it in our family, in our marriages, in our church, in society, at our, amongst our coworkers. We don't see those things because we're the ones doing them. And so that's why I think we ought to ask all of ourselves that question today. How often, whether consciously, out loud, or subconsciously, do we, ask the, do we say, you owe me. A spouse to another spouse, you owe me happiness. To a coworker, you owe me by picking up the slack. I deserve better than what you're giving to me. And if you're not willing to give it to me, then I'm going to give it to myself. I'm going to make sure I get what's mine. I'm going to make sure I get, get the things that I need, that I want in this life, because if you're not willing to give it to me, then I need to take it for myself. How often is that how we use the relationships in, in this transactionary way, where we say, yes, I'll give you this if you give me that. That's the attitude that Jesus is speaking against today. You could almost imagine how ridiculous all of those people looked compared to Jesus. There is Jesus sitting at this table, just content sitting where he's at, the ruler of the wind and the waves, the one who has power over life and death, the one that is here to save every single one of us from our sins is sitting in the corner, and he's not all that worried about where he's sitting. And then there's all of these other people who don't have the same power, they don't have the same authority, but they're all worried about their status. What causes Jesus to be like that? What causes Jesus in a similar situation to sit at a table with all sorts of people? But no, not the Pharisees, not the rulers, not the ones that are able to enhance his platform, not the ones that are able to make him look good, not the ones that are able to give him anything in return. What makes Jesus sit at a table with tax collectors and prostitutes and the ones that are sinners? What is it that makes Jesus sit down at the table with all of his brothers, look around, see a job that needs to be done, wrap his tunic around his waist and start washing feet. What makes Jesus wash the feet of those who he knew hours later were going to turn their backs on him? What made Jesus wash the feet of the person he knew was going to deny him three times? What makes Jesus wash the feet of the person he knew was going to hand him over to be betrayed? Love expressed through humility. Recognizing that he didn't need to fulfill his own needs in that moment. That instead, there were those outside of him that needed their needs fulfilled by him. We see those words, those words that, that rattle through our heads quite a bit, maybe growing up and, and still today, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we saw in James today. That's what Jesus was doing that day. Those days when he would sit with the sinners, those days when he would sit with those disciples, he was loving his neighbors as himself. He knew how his story ended. He knew that at the end of his life, he would be exalted to the right hand of the Father. And he said, it's not just good enough for me to do that. I want you there too. That's how he loves you as his neighbor. He says, what I have, I want you to have. So he came to this world and he lived in humiliation. That's what we call it, Jesus' humiliation. When he came down here, he took on flesh and he lived as a human being with all of the problems that come with it, even though he was above that, even though he easily could have kept himself above that, he descended to a place lower than he deserved for you and for me, 
so that he could keep that law that God had demanded of all people, love your neighbor as yourself, and he did it perfectly in our place. So that instead of of wondering and wandering in this life, thinking who on earth is going to exalt me if I don't exalt myself, so that we could live in peace with him, knowing that Jesus is going to put us exactly where he plans to. And that's why in this life we can, we can take the last seat, can't we? We can, we can sit in the back of the room. Jesus tells us, don't get sucked into the hustle and bustle of this world. Because the truth is, their opinions about you, they don't have eternal value. Your opinions about you don't really have any eternal value. My opinion of you has eternal value. Your God's opinion of you has eternal value. It's the only one that matters. And it is for that reason that we're able to say, you know what? Take the world. Take the adoration. Take the glory. Take the credit. And just give me Jesus. That's what we see in our reading today. Is Jesus saying, take everything else, but keep me. So what does that look like in our lives? I mean, it's all, it's all easy to say, yes, we should be humble as Christians, right? That's, that's an easy thing to, to aspire to, but what does that look like in our actual rubber-meets-the-road lives? When your spouse is treating you in a way that you, you know you probably shouldn't be treated. How does it manifest itself when, when you are at work and it feels like everything is falling apart and you are the only one trying to put the pieces back together? in a relationship where it feels very one-sided, like you're putting everything into it and getting absolutely nothing out of it. Ask, your question, ask yourself this question. Can I serve this person for Jesus? Can I keep serving this person for Jesus? My spouse, who we're going through a difficult time right now, can I keep serving that person for Jesus? That coworker. Who that, for, that relationship is completely fractured and frayed, can I keep serving that person for Jesus? That friendship that seems all too one-sided, can I keep loving that person first the way that Jesus loved me first? We ask ourselves that question, and, and really we couldn't fulfill on that promise to our God to love those people first if we weren't able to hold the cross up right in front of us where we see perfect and humble service right before our eyes, where we see somebody humiliating themselves to exalt another. But it's not really just about how we act when we're treated a certain way. In our last verses, Jesus calls us to treat others in humility in our active lives. When he says, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus is saying, I'm watching what this person's doing at this dinner. He's inviting these people with an agenda. He invited all of these Pharisees there because he knew that they had honor to offer him. He knew that they would pay him back at some point in his life. He knew that these people had something that would maybe someday down the line be of value to him. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't use other people that way. Instead, reach out to the people that have nothing to offer you. It's got spiritual and it's got practical implications, doesn't it? Because that's something we're all too familiar with, being reached out to when we had nothing to offer. Before we became Christians, before we were children of God, our Lord reached out to us when we were, when we were spiritually poor, spiritually blank, bankrupt, when we were blinded by our pride, when we were crippled by our sin, our Lord reached out to us and said, Here, you're invited. 
And we had nothing. We had empty pockets. We had nothing that we could give to him. The same way that the poor and the crippled and the lame back then had, had absolutely nothing to give the Pharisees. We have nothing that we could offer to God and say, oh, here, here this is, to which God would say, okay, that's, that's fair repayment. No, we have a God that was willing to do all of this freely out of the goodness of his love out of the great compassion that he has for dead sinners, he reached out to us and said, you're invited. And maybe that says something to us about how we we conduct our lives. I think there are times where, where people can go, if only our church was fill in the blank. If only our church was bigger. If only our church had more money. If only our church had more wise, older people, or if only our church had more young, energetic, vibrant people, if only our church had more kids, if only our church had more teens, if only our church had this or that. And I think sometimes we really fall into that. And God says, don't worry about the type. Invite them all. Invite the people that have nothing to offer. The people that that might join the church and that you look back and you go, yeah, they, they don't really have a whole lot to give. Maybe they don't have a whole lot to put in the offering plate. Maybe they don't have uh, that bright energy that you would like to have for the welcoming committee. Maybe they don't seem to have any of those skills that you would hope someone might possess in order to serve the church. And God says, don't worry about all that stuff. Just bring them in. Bring them in the exact same way that I brought you in. Those last That last phrase that we hear in in the final verse of our reading today is the one that is the most freeing. The resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, take all of the, the glory. Take all of the compliments. Take all of the honor. Take your status in this life. Take all of the things that you love about your life here, hold them up, and then compare it to that moment when the trumpet blows. When Jesus comes back for you and he calls you out of dust and calls you out of the tomb and says, friends, move up to a better place. Compare those two things and one far outweighs the other. Take your pride, but give me Jesus. Take your status, but give me Jesus. Take all of this world and give me Jesus. Thank God that he came to us and said, you don't need to worry about this world. You don't need to worry about the jostling. You don't have to position yourself amongst the believers because I know where you ought to be. And where you ought to be is right by my side in eternity. Everything else, everything else is temporary. But what I have to offer you, my exaltation, is eternal. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding, may it guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we confess our common Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we return our first fruits to the Lord.
Please stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, through the humiliation of your Son, you have called us to a place at your heavenly table. Teach us to treasure this place of honor, and so to spurn the foolish honors of this world. At the creation of Adam and Eve, you instituted and, and blessed marriage as the lifelong union of a man and a woman. And you commanded that it be held in honor by all, as a sacred sign of Christ and his bride, the church. Grant your blessing, therefore, to all husbands and wives, and to all who have pledged themselves to be united in holy matrimony according to your word, that their lives together in your name may be sanctified by your Holy Spirit in all wisdom, purity, self-sacrifice, and love. God of justice, you exalt the humble and humble the proud in your own appointed time. We commend to you the elected officials of our land. Grant them the desire to govern as those serving and giving them wisdom and courage to know what is right and to follow it. Merciful God, you call on us to practice brotherly love, to show hospitality to strangers, and to remember all those in need. We come to you confident that you will not leave us nor forsake us, but will grant us all that we need for this body and life. Bestow on us the full riches of your grace for all the situations and circumstances in which you, your people dwell. Remembering that here we have no abiding city, but that heaven is our home, give us your aid, that we may, by the true faith and godly life, prepare for the coming of our Savior, multiplying your mercy by loving our neighbor in need and loving you with all, all our body, soul, strength, and will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And this morning, Lord, we bring to you Shirley Ruger, mother of Deborah Briggs, who broke her ankle this week. Be with her, comfort her, uh, bring peace to her spirit, and if it is your will, bring healing for her body. Bless all those who work on her. All this we ask in your name. Amen. And we pray to you, Lord, as you have taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Go into this new week with the Lord's blessing so that we might humbly serve him together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll close with our last song.
You may be seated. Good morning once again, and God's, God's richest blessings to, to every single one of you. If you are a visitor uh, visiting with us, whether it's your first time or you've been coming back quite a few times, please do fill out those connection cards at the bottom of our, our, the card that you received on the way in and drop it in those blue buckets on your way out the door. That way we can stay in touch with you over these next coming uh, weeks and months. Getting to the announcements for the day, this Wednesday we have a Vespers service in place of our, the study part of our supper and study. Have no fear, we are not losing the supper part. Um, so we are going to have supper, and then at 6.45 uh, we'll have the, the Vespers as just kind of a, a nice meditative service that will be a little quieter, a little slower pace uh, for us to, to meditate on, on God's word for us that evening. It should be a, it should be a great time. Um, I will be leading a Peace Academy following worship today, right in here, 10, 15 minutes afterwards. We did sin last week um, and how we can use that to, to share the message with other people. Today, we're going to be talking about grace, uh, that which makes us Christian, uh, the grace of Jesus, and how we can, uh, we can use those basics in our everyday life talking to the people around us. Um, we'll continue. Uh, please do send letters to, to Portia Hubs. Uh, that, that announcement is still there. If you haven't gotten her address, it's right there. Or please talk to me or see Carly, uh, and we'll make sure we get you that. Uh, it's, it's very much appreciated. Also, September 7th, we have another supper and study, and we're going to do one that's kind of based on if you've ever had a question for a pastor um, that you just think that other people might want to know the answer to, and maybe you want to ask it anonymously or, or whatnot, um, please email me questions for September 7th. That way I can put together a good reply. But that'll be the, the focus of our supper and study is we're going, to or we're going to ask and answer some of those questions that might be really challenging and that we might be really wrestling with. So that should be a, a really fun evening. With that in mind, God's bless your, God bless your week as you serve him. <laughs>